true word of prophecy. Uh, I just wanted to say this before we actually get started. Pastor Greg Moore ministered at our church Sunday and, of course, at Karis, Cincinnati the day before. And uh, I just kind of want to sum up. If you haven't listened to that message, you can go on tlchurch.us or even my Facebook page and scroll down and listen to it. I would encourage you to because he said some really amazing things, uh, very profound as far as... Um, and, and, it, and it's the reason people don't connect with their purpose in life is he dealt with that. And, and basically it's because they never give God the right. They never give their say, God, I, not my will, but yours be done. They never initially pray that. And I, there's many people, I believe, and I've seen it a lot, where they're doing their thing, what they think they should do in the body of Christ, and they want God's blessing upon it. Rather than saying, what, Lord, what do you want? And I used the example years ago, I remember talking to a guy and he felt like he was called to teach the word in, in some pulpit ministry. And I asked him if he liked to study. And he said, no, nah, not really. And I'm thinking, it might not be called to that. I mean, I, maybe that was God was going to put that in him. But that's, that kind of comes with, the, with the, the gifting because you have to like to dig and to, to get into it. And I mean, that's what teaching in, in, you know, entails. And then another example that, I want to use for my own life, and, and I know me better than, of course, not as well as the Lord, but, but one of the things that I really did right by the grace of God in my early days was uh, I was really into rock music, used to have hair, and, uh, uh, and then when I got born again into rock music, I, we kind of switched to Christian rock. It was a transition, that whole thing, but one of the things I did was I prayed, God, if you don't want me to do music, change my heart, and because I can't. And I remember praying that. I was willing to be willing. And God took that desire for music away. I love music. I still appreciate music. I appreciate great guitar players, bass players. I think, you know, all that vocalist. I appreciate good musicianship. But uh, I just, I'm not into it. God changed that. And, and I say all that to say, if you're looking for God's purpose in your life, I encourage you to say, Lord, what do you want? And just say it and say, God, I, I can't change my desires, but I'm willing to be willing if you'll change my desires and you'll put your desires in my heart and he will do that. And, and, if, and if you're on a path and it's something that God hasn't called you to do, you will, you will lose the grace for that. Another example that I can use for my own life, a little bit different area, was I was working at Alcoa Building Products in Sydney a number of years ago. Of course, it's changed ownership a few times since then, but it was Alcoa then and I was working on the paint line. It was three on, three off and uh, working nights, and I thought, man, I'm going to love this three on, three off, because you get three days off. Well, let me tell you something. Your body never adjusts. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, it's just because you're, you don't get a regular rhythm. At least that's the way it was for me. But here's, here's uh, I was work, I'd worked at the warehouse for, what, 15 years? And then I went to the paint line for a while, and I, and I think, man, I, I'm gonna, I like the paint line. I'm going to stay here. But a notice came up to go back to the warehouse on the board. And I remember... Uh, I don't even know if I prayed. I just, all of, I mean, it's like my desire changed and I didn't want to be on the paint line. It's almost like I lost all grace for it. And then that notice, I'm not sure the order, but that notice came up and I put in for it and I got moved back to the warehouse right away. Here's my theory. I just believe God wanted me out of them chemicals <laughs> because there's a lot of chemicals and stuff involved there. But, but I say all that to say is what I noticed was I lost all grace to function on the paint line. All of a sudden, I couldn't stand it. And it's wild how that is. You've heard Andrew Womack talk about that when he was in, in um, uh, Cedarville, Texas. Remember that? He said, man, they love Cedarville. It was great. You know, they could have spent the rest of time. But all of a sudden, one day, he looked out and said, who would ever live here? <laughs> it's like, you know, they lost all desire for that. And, and you know, that's, here's my, my point and, and to kind of tailor in on, on what Pastor Greg Moore shared Sunday is that if we, if we just, God, what do you want? God has a unique purpose for every one of us. And, and I want God's purpose. I've often said, I don't want to spend my whole life doing my own thing, calling it God, and then not having it not be God. I want God's perfect plan and purpose for my life. To the best of my understanding, I'm, this is God's, for where I'm at right now, and I've just followed that day, day one day at a time. And, uh, and that's all we can do. And, and let me say this. I just did a Facebook post recently and it said, the voice of rebellion almost always is accompanied with God told me. <laughs> now, God definitely tells people, but I've heard so many people say, 
God told me this and God told me that. I've seen people, God told me this and then two weeks later, God changes his mind. And I often will say, I just wish God could get it together. God's not like that, you know, and, and there's stability with God. And, and, and I don't think he changes it. And even if he changes, God's not going to, uh, you know, he, there's going to be a process. You know, it's not going to be a jerk, you, you know, usually. And so anyhow, I said all that to say, Lord, what do you want? If you're willing to be willing, God will deposit his purpose in your heart. Amen. Isn't that awesome? I, I believe that was a prophetic word. Uh, sometimes people, it used to be in the old days, they would say, you got to say, yay, and all that kind of stuff. Well, you don't have to say that. You can just talk normal like I did. Amen. All right, let's get into this. From effortless change. This, is, this lesson, lesson nine, is entitled, A More Sure Word of Prophecy. Let's just start. Roman numeral number one. When I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and began to study the Word under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I realized that angelic visitations, the audible voice of God, and supernatural unctions from the Lord did not pass away with the apostles. I started asking questions like, how come I've never had any of these kind of supernatural things happen to me? Now, my story. <laughs> I'm a huge believer in praying in private tongues. I mean, I really believe in it as strong as any. I mean, it, it's only increased over the years. I believe in it because I believe it's for people like me who are smart enough to know they're not smart enough to figure life out. And so I, I believe when you do that, you're giving, you're praying mysteries, you're praying God's perfect will, you're praying revelation, all kinds of things. You're praying about things you don't, you don't know about. But so I have had that early on. I was born again in December of 1984. Shortly thereafter, I received that in Lima, Ohio. I was at a church service. It was not my home church. I went up there for a special speaker. I have no idea who he was. It's been so long ago. And there was a big group of people went up. We went up in a mass. The, the speaker was speaking. I guess we went up for the bath. I don't remember. But I was in there, and I was kind of towards the back of the group. And all of a sudden, I started praying and praising the Lord. And this language just come bubbling up out of me. I wasn't trying it. Nobody was coaching me. Nobody made me do it. I went like this. I did the music thing. And I, I mean, I, th I thought this is supernatural because when I prayed to receive Jesus in a car with a friend, I didn't, there was no fireworks, nothing. I just prayed a simple prayer. I believe I got born again, but I didn't know anything about tongues, which was a good thing. I didn't have any, I grew up Catholic. I didn't know anything. I had heard of it. I had been saved maybe a couple months and I'd heard of some lady that did it in a Baptist church and it, she'd bell her out. And I thought, oh, that's kind of weird. And I didn't really give it much thought. And, uh, but it come bellowing up out of me in this service. I went like this. And then I remember going to the associate pastor and saying, what is this? I mean, what happened? I mean, that's how ignorant and green I was of it. And then I came home. I was living with my parents, uh, still at home. And I went and I knelt down by my bed before I went to bed. And I, there it was again. I go, there was that language again. And it was there. And then it was probably a week or two later. I didn't know I could do it at will. And somebody told me that. I mean, I was really ignorant, <laughs> which was a good thing because I didn't have, well, it's all the deal. I didn't have all the stupid stuff I had to overcome. Now, since then, I've heard of all that stupid stuff. And I emphasize the word stupid because it's idiotic and it's not scriptural. There's a prominent study Bible uh, by John MacArthur, a Calvinist, who's great, great theological stuff in many areas. I'm not trying to criticize him. I'm not saying he's not a brother in Christ. But his stuff on 1 Corinthians 14 is absolutely insane. I'm just saying that for everybody out there. And I have one of his study Bibles. I have all kinds of stuff. I have, uh, I have a Book of Mormon. I don't keep it in the house. I keep it in the garage at home for witnessing purposes. <laughs> I, there's some things I don't keep in the house but uh, like that. I, no, I don't have a satanic Bible. That I won't even keep in the garage. But, uh, but, but that's just, just for research purposes, and we're actually for witnessing purposes. Uh, so I, 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 I had that baptism in the Holy Spirit early on. And, and man, and I, I really, and I would pray in the Spirit, and I was just, man, I would pray in tongues, and I would just do that, and, and, and uh, still try to do that a lot. But, but, man, it just seemed like the more I did it, and I would hear, of, you know, I was in, got in, around charismatic people and people that believed in the gifts and stuff, and they would talk about, like, visions and seeing all this, and I wasn't having that. Just like Andrew said, all I was getting was revelation from the Word. And I thought, I literally thought, what is wrong with me? Well, I mean, every, people are having these other things, and I'm not having any of it. Now, I got to tell you this, please, and I said this a few weeks ago, I have experienced this gold dust thing, which I don't put any emphasis on because it's not in here. It's not in there. You can't find gold dust. So don't make anything out of it. 
But I've had that happen at a couple times at one of our Zoom meetings with Pastor Greg for our ministers of group, Army. Uh, and all of a sudden I looked, and there was gold dust on this leg, and I looked down there, there's gold, and it's just like, what is this? But I, I don't make a big deal out of it because it's just, there's nothing in the Word. <laughs> so I'm not going to go there. You know, there can be lying signs and wonders. But my, my point in saying all that is saying that the more I prayed, the more I would see things in the Word of God and get revelation. And I literally thought, and it's still that way, I just thought there was something wrong with me because I thought I needed it needed to be more spectacular, more sensational. But you know what? God moves through his word. We're going to see that. This is the more sure word of prophecy. I now realize, my word, that's the Lord. <laughs> how, could, how, how, could I, how could I think? But you know, once again, we, this is what I think happens sometimes. Because people uh, desire to be accepted so much by other people. And you know, I want people to like me. We should all want that. But, but people will do things to try to, uh, not always, but they, just to try to show, hey, I'm, God moves in my life too. God told me this. God told me that. But you know, God's told me a lot of things. And you too. And this will protect you from deception. You know, um, I'll go, I've witnessed, I've done apologetics, okay? I've done Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. I've studied that stuff intensely back in the day. But one of the things that I will tell you about the Mormon church, the LDS, which is a false group. We pray for Mormons. Uh, uh, they, will, they pray and they, for God to show them that the Book of Mormon is true and that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. And they get from the Book of Mormon, they get what's called the burning in the bosom. In other words, it's a sexual, this feeling, this burning, and that tells them that the Book of Mormon is true and Joseph Smith is a prophet. Uh, true prophet of God. Well, the Book of Mormon is not true, and Joseph Smith was a false prophet. I'm just telling you that. And I've asked the Mormon missionaries before, I said, uh, the Bible says that some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I go, how would a seducing spirit make you feel? And I remember one of them, he didn't know what to say. And he said, well, not good. He just said, wait a minute. If I'm a seducing spirit and I'm trying to fool you, wouldn't I try to make you feel like this is right or this is good, like angel of light it talks about in, in 2 Corinthians 11, etc.? And well, here again, it could be pizza. You can't base things on your feelings. You've got to base it on the Word of God. Feeling, how many know feelings can fluctuate? I mean, if, if, how many know if we sit here and, and all of a sudden somebody comes and says, they just dropped the atomic bomb on you know, in Kansas or, or in Greenville or wherever, or something that blew the town up and we believed it, we're going to have feelings. But it, but it could be a total lie, you know? And, and we, we, feelings can, you, you, we have to go by the word. When the Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, it's the evidence of things not seen, faith has an object. That object is Jesus as he, and him crucified as revealed in the word of God. And God speaks so many things from the Word of God. I mean, it's powerful. I mean, I've got stuff from yesterday and today that just awesome. I never saw that before. The righteous shall flourish as a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Well, you know what I've been studying? How does a palm tree flourish? The word flourish means bud, sprout, blossom, bloom. But how does a palm tree bloom? I know. I, st I looked it up. I studied. I said, wow, that's awesome, Lord. Very has to be very shallow soil. You know, in order for the righteous to bloom, we can't put too much on people. We got to make sure the, the, the soil is shallow so they can grow. How does a cedar grow? Cedar of Lebanon grow. Very slow. Very slow. In fact, they don't even have, they can't reproduce. So they don't bring forth flowers until they're at least 25 or 30 years old. And I thought, Lord, because I've thought for a long time, I've got to be the slowest learner on the planet when it comes to spirituality because I feel like I've just done so many wrong things or haven't done right things in, you know, in understanding and stuff. But I realize, Lord, I think I'm right on track. I think you are working with me. Isn't this awesome? But I, but see, my point is, is that all the stuff in, that's in Psalm 92 verses 12 through 15, I got a whole bunch of stuff if you want to know where that's at. But it's so good. I mean, the word of God is rich and God, guide, the Holy Spirit, and I think I have this in the outline, he guides us into the truth. John 16, 13, Jesus said, not away from it. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. Jesus is the living word, but the Bible is the written word, and they're connected. See, some people, oh, no, we just worship Jesus. We don't worship a book. 
You ever heard anybody say that? Well, they're morons. They may be saved morons. We love them. We love morons. God loves them. And by the way, that's the Greek word for fool. You know that. Professing themselves to be wise, they became morons. That's the word. That's where we get it from. So, and, and, so I just thought I'd, I'm, I'm being scriptural when I say that. I'm not trying to be insulting, but I am trying to wake people up. Because people say a lot of dumb things. I think as Barry Bennett said, you wouldn't even know how to spell Jesus if it wasn't for the Bible. <laughs> I love that. All right, let's get into it. So, so that's my story. Then the Lord showed me this truth about how Jesus didn't respond to John the Baptist on an emotional level. But used God's word to raise him up to the level of speaking the word to him because of his respect for him. You know, I mentioned gold dust. Years ago, there was a move, gold dust movement. You know, it was crazy and flat feathers and all these kind of things. Goofy. You don't base anything on that stuff. Base, your, base it on the word of God. That's so simple. But people tend to be moved by those things. And the lady that was kind of the spearhead of it, I won't. She passed away prematurely. Ruth Heflin, I think, was her name. But, uh, but I'm not saying she wasn't a Christian. I'm not saying any of that. But we have to watch it with stuff like that. So even as I mentioned it, some people want to think that, oh, you're some kind. No, this is spirituality through the word of God. Amen. Two things by the grace of God that I know I've had right in my Christian life. Number one, the word of God. Always prioritize the word of God. I read through it every year. I read many Proverbs every month, Revelation every month. I read Psalm 119 every month. I read all over and study. But always make the word of God number one. No other book can usurp the word of God. Amen? And praying in tongues as much as possible. <laughs> I believe in that. Some people don't. There's people get mad say it isn't in the Word of God. They can say what they want. Paul said it like this. He that prays in an unknown tongue, his spirit prays. But his understanding is unfruitful. It's just that simple. I'm talking about private, like when you're in, you know, going throughout your day, uh, just praying in a language that's beyond your head. You can, you can give thanks well. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 17. Anyhow, so, and, I, and one of the messages I have is why people stop praying in the Spirit is because they don't hear it enough. And people don't talk about it. Oh, we believe in it, we just don't talk about it. No, you need to talk. You need to encourage people in their private time. You know, take time every day and pray in the Holy Ghost. You'll stay on fire, guaranteed. Guaranteed, because it it's, releases the fire. See, God starts the fire. Remember the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2? But we keep it lit. Andrew had a wonderful teaching on that. Out of Leviticus, even in the Old Testament. God had started the fire, but they had to keep it lit. They had to keep it lit. And how do you do that? You pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Good word. Thank you. All right. It's letter C. It's because he honored him. Jesus honored John the Baptist so much, not because he honored him so little, that he referred him back to the word. The Word of God is the foundation for stability. I began to see that believing the Word of God is actually the highest way to respond to the Lord. Now, you know Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to Him must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Faith is when you take God's Word over a circumstance. I heard a man of God years ago say, you know, when you're in faith, that's pleasing to God. When you believe God's word, even though the circumstances may be going contrary and you choose to believe God's word, that's pleasing to God. Isn't that awesome? You know, and faith gives them. I don't believe in healing because I see or don't see healings. I believe in it because the word of God says it. That's why. That's why. See the difference? Some people say, well, if I see it, I'll believe it. Oh, you'll have another excuse. Remember the voice from heaven? You know, not everyone believes. Some doubted. They didn't believe, even though they heard an audible voice from heaven. Some said it thundered. Some say, you know. All right, go. Um, letter E. Once I understood this, I turned the other direction and prayed, God, I want your best. If it honors you more for me to take you at your word and trust your word than to have a vision for you to quicken scripture to me and have, the, have that be the way I hear from you, instead of hearing an audible voice or an angelic messenger, then I'll be glad to go that way. Boy, here's several scriptures I got wrote down for you. First of all, go to Matthew 4. Matthew chapter 4. I'm going to show you this quickly. And that's not where I want to camp, but I'm going to show you some other verses. 
the word of the living God. Matthew chapter number 4. Now, this is when Jesus was tempted by the devil. Now, in chapter 3, a voice came from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And it goes right into chapter 4. And then it, it, Jesus was led up. He was tempted by the devil. Then eat 40 days and 40 nights. The devil comes to him in verse 3 called the tempter. And he said, if you be the son of God. Now, I want to say this to you. This is a little side trail that will help you. In verse 17 of chapter 3, you notice uh, the Lord spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved son. When Satan tempts Jesus, he said, If you're the son of God. Notice how Satan deleted the word beloved. If the enemy can, call, can get you away from knowing that you're loved of God, that's the first place he comes. See that? I thought that's interesting. But that's a little side. But now I want you to know what Jesus said. If man, if you're the son of a first, he tempted him and said, hey, turn these stones into bread. Remember, Jesus had was on a, quite a long fast. And Jesus said, it is written. And now he says this three times. You go down to verse 7. It is written. You go down, down to verse 10. It is written. You know what's powerful? Jesus Christ, the living word of God, could not improve on the scriptures, the written word of God. He quotes three times from the book of Deuteronomy. That fascinates me. That's fascinating. You know, we can do the same thing. It is written. It is written. It is written. You know, Pastor Greg talked out of Isaiah 54 and verse 13, how my children are taught of the Lord. My children are taught of the Lord. Great is their peace. Are far from oppression. You can say that. You can declare that. It is written. It is written. Man, it's so powerful. You know, what is written, once what is written begins to be spoken, what is written releases its authority. Amen? We believe, therefore we speak. It talks about spirit of faith. That's 2 Corinthians 4.13. We believe, therefore we speak. The flip side is that if you, you believe but you don't speak, you're not completing the cycle. You don't speak to earn, you speak to agree with. Amen. Praise God. That's good. But let me show you this. We're talking about the Word of God. Go to Matthew Ooh, 22. You're in Matthew. Go to chapter 22. I just want to show you this. And look at verse 28. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Now, notice what's going on. I'm, I'm really not after that parable. They said, hey, you know, in heaven, uh, they, uh, Jesus is taught, they, they, they were trying to tempt him and say, well, whose wife shall she be? There were seven brothers had this woman. They all died. And then finally the woman dies. Whose wife shall she be? Well, Jesus answered this, but I'm going to show you something here. Look at verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, the written word of God, nor the power of God. So notice what's going on here. The power of God is released through the scriptures. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read, now watch this, this is so good, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God? Now watch this, have you not read, written, which was spoken unto you by God? Well, let's see what that is. Look at this, Here's, here it is, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Huh. It said, God spoke that unto them, which be unto us. Where, where did that occur at? Well, let's look at it. Exodus chapter 3. Now, I want you to see this. This is the Word of God, guys. Some people say, well, that wasn't written to you. All Scripture, it may not have been written directly to you. It may have been for a different time dispensation, but all Scripture is written for you, every bit of it. Notice he says, you do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. And then he says here, he says, uh, that which was, uh, have you not read that which is spoken unto you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. It was written right here in Exodus chapter 3. Here it is. This is when Moses was at the burning bush. Did you know that? Exodus 3, verse 1 on down, but look at verse 6. Here it is. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. God spoke that to Moses. But Jesus said, God spoke that to you. Isn't that amazing? All Scripture, 2 Timothy, 
chapter 3, right? Verse, what, 16. All Scripture is God-breathed. It's given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished, completely outfitted unto every good work. All the promises of God. Well, that was a promise to Israel. That was a promise. Listen, if you're born again, we're the Israel of God. We're born again. We're the covenant people of God. Anybody that's born again, whether they're a natural Jew or a Gentile, we're in relationship with God. So, all, or excuse me, all the promises of God, 2 Corinthians 1.20, all the promises of God are yea and amen unto the glory of God. Watch this, by us or through us. You see that? It's God's glory, but he wants to manifest it through us. And all the scripture, all the promises of God are yes. I believe the yes is God's part and the amen's our part. Amen's, we're agreeing with it. So I just want you to see that when it comes to the word of God and interpreting the word of God, God spoke that to Moses, but Jesus said God spoke that to y'all. Isn't that awesome? So uh, this is the power of the Word of God. Look over uh, at John chapter 10. We'll just take another look, look here at something else I think is amazing. John 10, and look at verse 35. Now, I'm not going to get into this calling them gods. No, I'm not saying you're God. There's one God, and you and I are not Him. But in this sense, it's, it's in an authoritative sense. About Jesus is the King of kings. He is the king. We are kings under his kingship. And look at verse 35 of John 10. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. Here's what I want you to see. Notice what he said. Notice how he used word of God and scripture interchangeably, synonymously. See that? That's, that's the point I'm trying to make here. The word of God, the scripture is the word of God. I want you to see that. I think that's awesome. Now let me show you one more. Jump over to 2 Peter 3. Got to watch the time because it tends to slip away. 2 Peter chapter number 3. This is amazing stuff here. It's going to really get good. I'm just excited about it. I can feel the thunder. <laughs> All right. Look at this. Verse 15 of 2 Peter chapter 3. An account that the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, this is the Apostle Peter, he's referring to the Apostle Paul, also according to the wisdom of God, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, of these things, in which they that are, uh, in, in which some things are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. The word rest, that's verse 16, means twist. It means to torture the scriptures. <laughs> That's what literally mean. Put the scriptures to the rack. Watch this. As they do the other scriptures under their own destruction. Notice he, he talks about Paul's epistles, his writings. And he uses them, he calls them scripture. We just saw in John 10, 35, where the word of God and scripture are interchangeable. You see that? He's saying right here, they rest Paul's writings, his epistles, his letters, as they do the other scriptures under their own destruction. Peter's saying that Paul's writings are scripture. And it goes on and say, Ye therefore, verse 17, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you fall, uh, beware lest you be led away, I'm sorry, with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And that, that growth is growing in our understanding of Scripture. If You know, the Holy Spirit will always lead you into the Word of God, not away from it. Always. Always. I'm, and now, well, what about a situation where it doesn't say turn on Jones Road or whatever? Well, there's the peace of God. There's the inner witness. Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To the which you are called. It talks about the peace. Peace acts as an umpire, the Greek says. Call situations safe or out. We should be living in peace. It shouldn't be like, well, constant turmoil and all of a sudden the peace of God hits me. No, we should be there. If there's a break in the peace and something doesn't feel right, don't override that. You ever did that? Man, I knew I shouldn't have done that. No, don't raise your hand. <laughs> all right. Okay. Roman number number two. Satan can also appear in an angelic form. Let's look at that. The scripture there, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14. 
Satan can appear in an angelic form. See, Satan has no authority. He's been completely stripped of his authority, which is why he's such a good liar and a deceiver, because that's all he's got. I've often say this. If, if you're stronger than me, and I want to, uh, uh, or no, excuse me, if I'm stronger than you, and I want to defeat you, I'll just whip you, right? But if I'm weaker than you, and I know it, I know I can't whip you. So I've got to somehow deceive you into defeating yourself or get somebody else that I've deceived to come against you, but I can't directly defeat you. That's how Satan is. He's a, it's what, in the book of Isaiah talks about they're going to look upon him and say, is this the one that weakened the nations? Amen? But with that said, look here in 2 Corinthians 11, and we'll, we won't take all these verses, but look at verse 14. And no marvel, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. That word transform, I believe it's sun skumazo or something like that. It means he masquerades as an angel of light. People don't see that. They think, no, he comes. I'm not going to get into the Antichrist thing. But the spirit of Antichrist, there's two facets of it. There's the secular version, the political Antichrist. And then there's the Antichrist spirit in the body of Christ. The Antichrist, or it's religious. And, and anti, notice it's Antichrist, not anti-God. That's big. It's usually pro-God, but anti-Christ. That's why it's so deceptive. And anti-Christ, anti can mean against, directly against, but it also means in the place of or in the steed of. So the spirit of anti-Christ works in the body of Christ by causing you to put yourself, what you do for God, instead of what he did for you in the place of him. Very subtle. And people follow that, fall for that. That's the spirit of Antichrist in the pulpit. That's why it says that Satan's ministers or those who administer this are in their, their ministry. They come as ministers of righteousness. Look at the Judaizers in the book of Galatians. They were saying, yes, you're saved by grace. Debbie, that's great. But if you really want to be righteous, you need to keep the feast days. It's Passover time. You know how common that is on Christian TV? I don't watch Christian TV, and I haven't for a long time. I listen to Andrew on my phone and teaching. But it's common. Oh, uh, yes, I know. But, you know, you got to you, you know, buy my book, and you'll get free from generational curses. Generational curses were in the Old Covenant, but they're not in the New Covenant. You're a new generation, 1 Peter 2.9, because you're in Christ. That was broke in Christ. That's why it says in, in, I think it's Ezekiel 18, I think it's also in Jeremiah, you'll no more say this proverb. The, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, you'll no more say that because the fathers ate sour grape. This is what's happened to the children. Generational curse. He said, you're not going to say that proverb anymore because it's a new covenant. It was prophesying the new covenant. Isn't that exciting? Glory to God. All right. I think it is. Uh, so, Satan can appear uh, as an angel of light. Remember in 1 Kings 13, I think we looked at that one time. Remember the man who had a word to go prophesy against the altar and all that stuff? It was uh, uh, in, in 1 Kings 13 and the, and the king and he turned his hand to the leper, all these different things. I mean, it was a legitimate thing. But God told him, don't stop anywhere. Don't eat with anybody. Just do it and return. And then he was doing fine until the other guy went out and said, I too am a prophet. And God told me. And that's what fooled him. What is that angel of light? That's what I say when people come up and pull the God told me card. What I mean by, I mean, I'm, God does tell people things. But rather than, here's what humility sounds like. You know, hey, I, I really believe God's telling me this. You know, pray with me about this. And what do you see? I mean, it's not, I mean, God told me. And it's like, maybe, maybe not. Let's judge it. We need to judge what we believe God told us. And if it doesn't line up with what God told us, we throw it out. Amen. You know, that would, I've heard of people, and I mean, I can tell you stories, and I'm sure you can tell me some also, but I'm thinking of people, well, you're supposed to marry this person. That's insanity. The new, see, there's, people don't understand the difference between Old Covenant prophets and New Testament prophecy. Are there prophets in the New Testament? Yes, but they do not usurp the Holy Ghost. That's what my wife and I were talking about the other day. And, and we've seen it, man, where people's lives have just been. Uh, my wife was telling me about one recently. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Now people, well, I'm going to do this and do that because somebody told me this. You better judge it by the word of God. The number one thing that people need is to be grounded in the word of God. 
in relationship with the Holy Spirit. If you can't find it there, I tell people that, all, if you listen, I'm willing to be wrong, but you've got to show me from God's word. Don't just say, well, we don't believe it that way. That's fine that you don't believe it that way, but what does the word of God say? Because there's a lot of squirrely stuff out there. You know the two things that I see in the New Testament that like Paul and Peter and John and all them were doing? The two primary things. Number one, they were establishing new covenant doctrine. Number two, they were coming against deception that deceived people away from new covenant doctrine. Those are the two primary things that they do. You see it all throughout. The, he says, James says in James 3.1, be not many teachers knowing you're going to receive a stricter judgment. You're going to receive a stricter judgment. It's important what is taught. And if we got it, we and use the word of God. The word of, that's what I believe. I believe every church, and I've said this before, and I'm not the only one. Joseph Prince said it. Bobby Indian said it. So you can blame them. I believe every church service should be a mini Bible college. I believe that. I believe that's why we give outlines. We try to get as much, because I want you in the word. That's what changes lives. That's what changes lives. Not personalities or I mean the word of God and we, empowered by the Holy Spirit amen he yeah, all right praise God moving right along so um, you can see and hear things that can lead you astray you know the Berean Christians they it says in, in I'm not going to go there for the sake of time in Acts 17 verses 10 and 11 and it says in verse 11 these were they were more noble than those in Thessalonica they received the word but they searched the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. He said that was a good thing. That was a Nobel thing. Amen? But if you go through the Word of God, you'll be safe. Amen. The Word of God is the acid test for everything supernatural. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about lying signs and wonders. You need to realize that the Lord may not have answered your prayer in the way you've been asking because He has something better for you. Because He loves you so much, not because He loves you so little. And I, 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 the more we let go, the more we let God. And it goes back to, Lord, I'm willing to be willing. You, you, do, you do this your way. It's called humility. You know God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I gotta, I got, I'm going to pull it out when we get to chapter 4 of James in our verse-by-verse -verse study. And I'm going to show you how God resists the proud. It's, some people are praying against the devil and rebuking the devil and it's not the devil that's fighting them it's God resisting them because he can it's not personal but he cannot endorse pride pride is when I'm my own boss when I don't give it to God that's why people are frustrated trust in the Lord with all your heart how much of your heart all of it lean not under your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him the word acknowledge is the Hebrew word yada it's intimacy Adam knew Eve yada and she conceived that was more than a head nod. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. That's awesome. But, you know, we make it hard. The Lord showed me this uh, recently. I was, I, was, I, was I was going over an outline that I put together, and I was praying in the Spirit, and I just felt the, the desire to stay just meditating on that outline. I thought, oh, no, I need to do this. I need to do that. And, and it's the Lord spoke to me, and he said, you make it so difficult. Just follow that desire. You're praying in the Spirit. You're in my Word. Just follow the desire. Wow, Lord. I do make it hard, don't I? That's just, that's how we are, you know, because of people. I was, Dudley Hall had in his book, Grace Works. I got to watch the time. But he had in his book, Grace Works, I read years ago. I wish I had it here. I'd read it to you. He said they were on a hunting trip in Mexico. Very slow paced area. Just, you know, slow. And the one guy come up, he goes, you ever run into people and they have to make everything complicated? And he said, this guy come up and said, now what do you want to do first? You want to go hunting? You want to get the ice? You want to get the, 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 the beverages? You want to get the soda pops, whatever we're drinking? You want to do that first? You want to run in here? And he had all these, this agenda of everything. Everybody's looking at him like, we're chilling. Who cares? Just get some ice. We don't care. And, and point being, he said, you know, sometimes we get this tendency to make everything bigger and more difficult than it is. People are not good at enjoying the moment. I've determined that, including me many times. It's always like when this happens or there's something out there. The Bible says wisdom is before him that has understanding, but the eyes of a fool are in the ends of the earth. He's always looking out there for what he has right here. That's Proverbs 17, 24. Isn't that amazing? I think it is. And a fool in the Bible is someone who trusts in their own heart. That's Proverbs 28, 26. 
Hallelujah. It may be that he's, God is trying to bring you to a higher level of maturity. He wants you to get beyond just an emotional level and learn to receive from him through his word. Psalms chapter 1 and verse 2 talks about that. In, in the law of the Lord he delights, which is the word of God. And the word delight means it's an excited uh, delight, excited pleasure from the word of God. I rejoice at God's word as one who finds great treasure. That's Psalm 119, verse 162. In 2 Peter 1, the Apostle Peter was saying that he realized he was close to his death and therefore found an urgency to remind the believers of the truths he had shared with them before. I'm going to kind of pick up the pace here so we finish. Peter talked about how, about how that he saw Jesus radiate light. He saw the glory cloud overshadow him. He heard an audible voice out of heaven saying this, is my beloved son. Matthew 17, 1 through 9. He saw these things, but then he said, we have something better than all of this. Wow. What could be better than seeing the Mount of Transfiguration, the radiance of the Lord and manifesting in an audible voice from heaven? What could be better than that? What could be more sure than that? Well, we'll see here in a minute. Here it is. What could be better than seeing the visible presence of God and hearing his audible voice? Here it is. 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 20. Knowing this first, how, when should we know this? First, second, third. According to this first, no prophecy of the Scripture. Remember we saw that the Scripture is the Word of God? In John 10, 35, Matthew 22, we saw that it's, it's not of any private interpretation. This prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Look at 2 Peter 1. Look at verse 17. We'll start with verse 17. Well, I'm in 1 Peter. Let's get in 2 Peter. Look at verse 17. For he received from God, referring to Jesus, the Father... God the Father, honor and glory when there came such a voice uh, to him from the most excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount or the holy mountain. Look at this. We also have a more sure word of prophecy. More sure word of prophecy than an audible voice from heaven. That is amazing. You know how many cults have started? by somebody, God spoke to me audibly and told me he'd teach me the word of God as it hasn't been known since the first century if I would teach it to others. Anybody know who that is? It's a Victor Paul Weirwell, The Way International. And then he threw all of his books away and he started teaching. He wrote a book called Jesus Christ is Not God. Blasphemy. You know, The, the, the Way International. He was the founder of it. But that's what he said. Joseph Smith, the founder of, of the LDS, Latter-day Mormon Church, said that uh, there was a supposedly big revival going on in the area. And he, and he said something. He said, well, should I which one should I join? And, and supposedly God spoke to him, I assume audibly, and said, you don't join any of them. Their creeds are an abomination. Their professors are corrupt. They're, they're, you know, I'm going to show you. In other words, God speaks to you audibly. He's going to show you something that no one else has seen. Now, that's wrong. That'll get you in trouble. I, people open up to demons. But people do it individually. They may not start a group, but they do it too. There's, let me say this to you, and I'm going to say this in love. We need other people in the body of Christ. We just do. I know people that they're so spiritual they can't fellowship with nobody. You know why? Because nobody's as spiritual as they are. They are deceived on steroids. I'm not saying they're not born again. I'm not saying they won't go to heaven. If they've accepted Jesus, they will. But I'm telling you, they'll never fulfill their purpose. Never. If they stay on that path. The good news is they can repent. But see, you get harder. You get idealistic. Satan does his greatest work in isolation. Just ask the demoniac. We're not to be codependent. We're not to be independent. We are interdependent. We need the body. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, If we walk, walk, walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Koinonia, intimate fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. 
That's not talking about sins positionally. It's talking about sins in our everyday because we're walking in the light. You know, sometimes it's hard to fellowship with people that are not as perfect as we think we are. <laughs> but see, that's part. We need other people. Well, you need people even to rub you the wrong ways. That's part of your growth. I don't want to hear that. Well, I'm just telling you the truth. It's part of our growth. See, it's easy to pull. I mean, I, I've seen things where, oh, man, and people, I just want to get away and live in a cabin and not be around people. I had one guy say recently, he says, he goes, I just, you know, I, I can handle people, but only in small doses. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, people are what, G, those, what Jesus died for, his people. If my calling and my biblical knowledge is calling me to pull away from people and not like people, it's a knowledge that puffs up. Because love edifies. It's, not, it's just information that's not transforming my life. Because people are what it's all about. And they got problems. I often tell people, God's called you to sit in the smoking section of the world. That means to reach out to people. As you, be led. I'm not saying, but God's going to bring people in your life. Because you got something they need. Amen. All right, I got to go. We got to fly here. Okay, when I said... And so this voice, verse 19 of 2 Peter 1, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, wherein you do well as you take, that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arises in your hearts. Now, I don't have time to get into all this, but this is talking about how the scriptures point to Jesus. When it says this, we also have a more sure word of prophecy. The word prophecy, my favorite definition, it means to speak forth the mind of God. And in Revelation 19.10, it says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The written word points to Jesus, the living word. In fact, all legalism is, Christian legalism, is when you separate Jesus Christ and Him crucified, what He has done, from the word of God. So once you take Him out, all you're left with is a bunch of rules that you have to keep, which no one can. So He kept them. So you remove Him, and that's what legalism is. But... Uh, it says, we, uh, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. That's the testimony of Jesus revealed in the scripture. We see in the scripture in verse 20. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place. What is the dark place? This world. Until the day dawn. What day? The day we live in. The day of the new covenant. Remember that song? This is the day. This is the day. You know where that's from? Psalm 118 verse 24. And if you read that, it's talking about Jesus. It's a prophecy of Jesus. The stone which the builders rejected, that's Jesus. The Jew, they were, he was rejected, etc. It says, so, so until the day dawn, in other words, the revelation that you're in this day of the new covenant dawn, and the day star, the star of that new day, Jesus, Yeshua, arises in your heart. You take heed. And then it goes on, knowing this first, that no prophecy from the scripture, of the scripture, the mind of, of God, speaking forth the mind of God, is of any private interpretation. Now, private, I'm going to give you, this is so good. I used to think private was just, um, uh, well, you got your interpretation, you got yours, you got yours. And it, it, it includes that. I'm not minimizing that. But private means pertaining to oneself, making it about you instead of Jesus. I love that. that just, when I saw that, I thought, my word, that's awesome. A private interpretation, yes, it can be individual. The reason it's individual is because we're not making it about Jesus. We're making it about us. A private interpretation is when you make the scripture pertain to your, your savior instead of him. You're your representation, your high priest before God and not him. That's a private interpretation. Isn't that something? That's why we have the more sure word of prophecy revealed in the scripture. It's more sure word of prophecy, even then an audible voice from heaven. And it's talking about him. So we do well that we take heed unto this until that day dawns, we, the revelation of the new covenant that we live in, the day dawn, the day that the Lord has made, and that day star rises in our, in our hearts. I would go to Psalm 118, but we don't have time. But uh, just read, just go there and read like verse 19 through 24 at your own leisure. That's how Joseph Prince says leisure. Okay, at your own leisure. All right, so therefore the word of God is the strongest, most powerful. No, no, back up to F. I got a, Peter said, the most authoritative thing I could possibly share with you to validate the truth is the word of God. The word of God is greater than any other way to hear from God. 
Therefore, the word of God is the strongest, most powerful way that we have to counter our fears and unbelief. Amen. Amen. The problem is most people don't honor the written word of God the way they would honor a prophecy or word of encouragement from a person or some audible or visible sign. You know, people do this. You got a word for me? You got a word for me? And people want, they, they will put more value on a word than the word. I'm telling you guys, it's dangerous. You got a word for me? Yes. Yes. You know, I think it was Sarah Bowling, Marilyn Hickey's daughter. And I think when she was at Karis, I think she taught this and it's really good. And the Lord's been, uh, has dealt with me about this too, about, you know, giving people words from the word. When something comes to me, I got a word for you. Here it is, guys. I'm going to give it to you. Ready? It's in Psalm 41 verse, or excuse me, Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Watch this. Here, I'm going to give you this word. Here, it's awesome. It says, fear thou not. God's saying, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. Don't be overwhelmed. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. Isn't this good? This is a word I'm giving you. Yea, I will help you. And that word help means specifically tailor-made help for your specific situation. I'm giving you a word. This is a word. This is a prophetic word. Yea, I will uphold thee with my, the, the right hand of my righteousness. He is a very present help in trouble. That's a word. Take it. Somebody say amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right, let's, let's fly. Um, that's backwards when you look for a word over the word. And, and now God will use a word, but it will never contradict or go against the word. And you have to test it all by the word. That's why it says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians that let one prophesy and the others judge. Judge what? The prophetic word. Is it lining up with the scriptures? All right. That's backwards, and it's precisely the reason we have so much doubt. The Lord will meet you where your faith is at. God had spoken to many people through, God has spoken to many people through different external ways. We're not against that. I'm just saying that if you are more insistent, more desirous of a sign, a fleece, which Gideon did, an audible voice, a visible representation, gold dust, something miraculous that will help you, that's just a temporary fix. Circumstances change. The signs point to the substance of God's word. But if you would go to the word of God, making it your absolute authority and viewing it as God speaking to you, then the word will overcome any doubt you have. The Lord's told me this before. He said, the more words you put in you, it's like turning up the volume knob on the voice of God, on hearing God's voice. Amen. God's word will confirm everything you need to know. That is may not sound exciting because you look at the Word of God as being lifeless, dead, and dry. But see, when revelation comes, Jesus said it like this, Matthew 4, 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, rhema, proceeding, present tense, out of the mouth of God. How does that happen? When you go to the Word, and you meditate the Word, and you, I believe in mixing with praying in the Holy Ghost, meditating, all of a sudden something will jump at you. What is that? That's revelation. That's a rhema. What is a rhema? It's a fresh application of the eternally written word. The logos is the entirety of the word. Jesus is the logos. But when you get a fresh application of the eternally written word, that's a rhema. I'm going to show you, well, I'm going to show you this one quick. John 15. This is a good example of rhema and logos. John 15, and look at verse 3. Jesus said, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. That speaks of position. The word, word there is logos, the entire word, Jesus being the logos. But look down at verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, there it's rhema. It's a fresh application of the eternally written word. It's a revelation from the logos. If, if you abide in me, my, in other words, I'm speaking to you from my word. Abide in you, watch this, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Isn't this awesome? Look at verse 8. Herein, or here's how my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. That's John 15, 7 and 8. How is the Father glorified? That you bear much fruit. What is the fruit he's talking about in this context? Answered prayer fruit. God's glorified when our prayers are answered. Isn't that awesome? But notice how it comes. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Well, I have, I have that a Greek thing from Weist on those verses. It's amazing. 
But that's awesome. If you abide in me, in other words, keep your faith in me, you know, and, and my words, and then you're getting, you're living by those rhema, those revelation from the Lagos. You're, you're getting that. And my words abide in you. You'll ask what you will, and it will be done unto you. That's awesome. And the Father's glorified through answered prayer. That your joy may be full, it says in John 6, uh, I think it's John 14, verses 13 and 14. All right. I got to fly here. Boy, do I got to fly. <laughs> How does this happen? Uh, that's a good thing, though. Uh, that's because we haven't get, uh, gotten sincere. This is letter A under Roman numeral number six. We haven't gotten sincere and serious enough to have the Holy Spirit quicken the Word of God to us. He is the teacher of the Word of God, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But I tell you, God's Word is alive. It's powerful. Hebrews 4.12 talks about that. A greater blessing and anointing would be released in your life if you would take the truths of God's word by faith and say, I believe this is God speaking to me. I've had it revealed to me by the Holy Spirit and I don't have to have three goosebumps and two visions to confirm it. This is what God's word says. Look at John 20. This is Thomas in verse 29. Watch this. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not physically seen and yet believed. Isn't that something? Thomas believed because he saw. When we believe because of the Word of God, which we see by faith, we see into the Word, he, there's a great blessing on that. Isn't that awesome? Man, oh man, that's awesome. The Word of God is a more sure word of prophecy than anything else you could ever get. If you would take God's Word, begin to meditate on it, let the Holy Spirit make direct application to your situation. Remember that? Isaiah 41 verse 10, that He is your help. The Hebrew says he's a, it's tailor-made help for your specific situation. You make, allow the Holy, I'm going to read that again. If we would take God's word, begin to meditate on it, let the Holy Spirit make direct application to your situation, and then act on it, that's the highest form of faith you can possibly have. That's faith <coughs> based entirely upon God's word alone. God's word is his covenant. Did you know that? The word is synonymous with covenant. Psalm 105 verse 8. Saw, uh, 1 Chronicles 16, 15 says, Be always mindful of the covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Isn't that something? What is, this, is, this, is, this is the will and the testament, the covenant. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. That's awesome. Let's pray and, and we're done. Don't forget the Karis uh, offering thing if you want to participate in that. Father, right now we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus, the living word, and the Holy Spirit who makes him real to us through the word of God. Help us to prioritize your word in every single area of our life. I pray for those who are listening, either now or later, that they would hear that God's calling is, is revealed to them in, their, in the word of God. And that the most exciting thing that one can experience is just revelation from the Word of God. That God's showing us stuff on a consistent basis. Father, I just pray, Father God, for supernatural revelation knowledge from the Word of God to all who will receive it. And if you receive that, just say amen. Amen.